Well, welcome everyone to the Three Circle Church podcast. My name is Jonathan Duke. I am the Daphne campus pastor for Three Circle Church. And with me today is the one and only Jordan Thrash. Jordan, introduce yourself and tell them about what you do for Three Circle Church. Yeah, man. Uh, well, first off, glad to be here with us today. I absolutely love being a part of this podcast every chance I can. Um, as Jonathan said, my name is Jordan, um, and I think I am one of the one and onlys. Like, if you go on Instagram, I, I, I can't find a second one of me yet. It's true. You know? Uh, but here, I am the young adults and connections pastor, and essentially what that means, I have the opportunity to do spiritual development for those that are 18 to 30 year old um, here at our um, campus and really globally kind of setting the tone for that. Um, focusing primarily on like small groups, but we also have a ministry residency that runs out of that. So one of the big passions of mine has been equipping the next generation for ministry. And so being a part of that program has been awesome and just getting to see the next generation step into that. Uh, and then with connections, I have the opportunity um, to provide oversight to things like uh, services, environments, um, some of our internal systems and structure and um, it, it's a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. So in summary, Jordan has probably the longest job description of any other employee at Three Circle Church. I tried to keep yeah. a lot of it out in that, yeah, in that short yeah, intro. Yeah. No, I totally get that. Yeah, because he, he I mean, uh, everything he just said is like 40 percent at most that, that he does around here. But Jordan is an integral part of uh, what happens at Three Circle Church and does so many things and uh, had the had the privilege this week of teaching uh, at the Fairhope campus. And I was able to teach at the Daphne campus. And so kind of neat. We're uh, we're good friends and we love the opportunity to communicate and we love getting to discuss it. And so that's what we're going to do today is we kind of look beyond the weekend and kind of dive a little bit deeper into, uh, you know, kind of how we tackled this passage of scripture from First Peter and uh, in the midst of this series that we've had going on called Storm Shelter. And, uh, you know, really this idea that Peter uh, is preparing Christians for storms, storms that they're already in the midst of, but also storms that are on the horizon headed that way. And he wants them to, to be prepared for that. He wants them to be aware that storms are coming. And, and, you know, one of the things I referenced this week is that Jesus told his disciples, he said, you will have trouble. Yeah. You know, so I think uh, sometimes we can kind of get this wrong impression when it comes to following Jesus that, oh, it's going to make life easier across the board. And in so many ways, it makes our lives better, you know, uh, oh, yeah. fuller and and uh, definitely, you know, more holy and righteous. And we're definitely honoring God. But but Jesus warned us. He says, with that, in an environment that is not set up to be a warm and welcoming environment to Christianity, which is the world that we live in, uh, Peter even talks about that. He, he wants us to be aware that in that context, when we live out our faith, trouble's coming. And so Peter lived this. He experienced it firsthand. Of course, uh, Peter ultimately gets martyred uh, for his yeah. faith, according to church history. And uh, so Peter lived it and and uh, experienced it firsthand, wanted to prepare early Christians for it. And so what we had the privilege of doing is the text that we looked at uh, this week, which is First Peter 2, uh, towards the end of that chapter, verses 11 through the end, uh, really details uh what the the action steps are for the believers. So uh, really the first part of his letter is kind of teeing up their identity and, mm -hmm. and their values and what they should cling to from a belief perspective and who they are in Christ. And then he says, now, now because you understand all that and we've got that established, here's what I need you to get to doing, right? And so share a little bit, Jordan. Uh, you know, again, the idea is, hey, you're in foreign territory here. He, he references that at the beginning of the text. Uh, and he says, you know, you're aliens, you're foreigners, uh, and help us to understand what is he meaning when he says that? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so, you know, I, I love getting into the Word. I love doing a deep study. And one of the things I love about the Word of God is obviously that's living. And every time we read it, you know, we learn a little bit more. And, it, you know, it's applicable to the stage of life that we're in. But also what I love is when you take the time to study it, um, you can take verses at face value. Mm -hmm. And then you can dive in a little deeper. And so one of the things that he hits on is the idea that they're exiles and sojourners. And so what, the, what that term really means is they're travelers. This is not, they're not where they're permanently meant to be, right? Uh, I kind of talked about this a little bit, but uh, for me, it's like the difference between camping and living in a house. And so right. he's calling them like, hey, you're a sojourner, you're a traveler, you're out there camping. Um, but what's important for us to understand is if we take that at face value, uh, which it's easy to do, it's, oh, okay, well, they're not in the city of Rome right now because of everything that's taking place. 
Um, and what we do understand is, yes, the Christians were in exile. Yes, the Christians were hiding and they were going into caves, but they weren't actually picking up and leaving their entire lives and hitting reset. It wasn't, hey, we're facing this persecution. Well, hey, let's just leave Rome altogether. Let's go to Turkey. Let's get to Ephesus. Let's go hang out where they're not dealing with this. No, they stayed in that area. And so when you keep that in mind, the term exile and sojourner, it almost doesn't hit the mark all the way. But when you read a little bit further and you see that he's discussing their conduct, he's discussing their calling, you realize that that has a secondary meaning, right? And, and that secondary meaning um, is talked about uh, to the church of Corinth by the apostle Paul. And what I love uh, about Paul is he's the theologian and, you know, Peter's the, the pastor. Right. And you can actually see, like, Peter read Paul's letters. <laughs> like, you, like I, I truly, you know, believe, like, because you, you can see Paul, like, dives into some deep stuff, and then Peter teaches on that stuff. Yeah. And so uh, how Paul addresses it, he's like, hey, here's the deal. Your, your home right now on earth, it's a tent. It is a temporary dwelling. Your tent can be destroyed. Your life can be destroyed. Where you are going to end up, your permanent home is a home that is built in heaven. And so when I read that passage and I'm sitting there and studying and I'm thinking, man, you know, he, he's obviously discussing the situation at hand, but when it comes to my conduct, my immorality, my, my ability to give into the culture, that's going to make my life easier on earth. Mm -hmm. right. It's not going to make my life harder. Right. So then why would he be warning me of that? Right. No, no. What's going to make things harder and what's going to change things is if during this temporary time when I'm a sojourner in an exile... I make decisions that are going to impact the eternal. And so when I read that, I'm sitting there thinking, this is not referencing just the physical location. It's, it's referencing the spiritual one, the, the fact that the stuff that they're about to face, if they take the easy way out, if they go with the culture, if they abandon the faith, if they try and blend in with the Romans, yeah, this persecution, it's, it's going to go on easy mode. But what that's going to do is it's going to affect their eternal home. It's going to affect that permanent dwelling. And so that's why he's warning them so much about the conduct that's going to come with the sexual immorality that the Romans were a part of or, or really all of the stuff that, that Paul even listened uh, to the Church of Galatia. He's like, hey, if you do these things, you may blend in with the Romans. Right. If, and if you're not careful, what that's going to do is it's going to impact the eternal. And so I think that's almost the, the, the preface to the warning. Like, hey, what I'm about to tell you about conduct it has it has a little weight right now. It has massive weight for yeah. the future. Well, and you you read the text and and you see where he's going with this. You're like he says, "Hey, you're living in foreign territory, right? Spiritually, like we're talking about, um, not not physically. They're not in a in a uh, place that's not their home." He's he's saying spiritually, you're you're fo a foreigner, and uh, and what he's teeing up there is this idea that hey, you're going to be around a bunch of people who don't have the same values as you, mm -hmm. who don't have the same morals as you, who aren't following the same leader, the, the same Lord as you. Uh, and so what you're going to be doing as believers and as Christians is going to be foreign to those people. And as, of course, you're reading this, and I imagine being in the early church, you start reading what, what Peter's writing here, and then you start uh, having some desires that, that you hope Peter's going to say some things that are things that you probably want to do as a Christian. And and, and here's where the, the rub is. You know, for me, when I start reading Peter's words here, I'm like, oh man, tell us that we can be defiant, that we can get out mm -hmm. there and upset people, that we can uh, be in their face with the truth, that we can offend people and that we can, you know, just make the list, right? Because that's what I want to do. Like if, yeah. if someone opposes my Lord, if someone opposes my Heavenly Father, if someone opposes Scripture, uh, my flesh, the the sinful nature in me says, oh, let's go show them, you know, and yeah. make a scene. And But what's so incredible here is Peter starts to say, hey, when you're living among these, among these people and your values are foreign to them, the very first thing I need you to do is live honorably. Yeah. Live honorably. And, and this idea of the way you conduct yourself is going to speak volumes to those people, but it's not going to be in the way that your, your sinful flesh wants. It's not going to be by, uh, you know, one of the things I talked about is Jesus said, I'll be the stumbling block uh, earlier in, in, in the chapter uh, of First Peter. Jesus says, I'll, I'll handle being the, being the stumbling block. That is, that is my responsibility. But he doesn't call a Christian to be someone's stumbling block. Yeah. And the way I kind of look at that is like, I never want to have to stand before God and say, hey, my actions drove someone away from the truth of Scripture. That's so good. My actions drove someone away from the church. 
my actions made someone believe less in a God who loves them and cares for them. And so, uh, you know, as we talk about, like, Peter's telling us how to live and how to live honorably. One of the things that he he kind of tees up is this idea of uh, respecting and honoring those in authority. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's always uh, just easy to do, right? I mean, you've never had any issue with yeah. authority or anything like yeah, that, n- right? Yeah, none at all. <laughs> none at all. I, I'm glad this isn't a video podcast. <laughs> that's right. People may believe me. Uh, that's no. right. That's right. <laughs> no, we both have the personality types that, uh, you know, we uh, we look to people who are, are strong leaders and, yeah. uh, you know, have, have a high uh, uh, value of respect for good leaders. Um, but we're strong personality types, both Jordan and myself. Yeah, and we're, so, we're not in the sorcery or anything, but we are both eights <laughs> on the Enneagram. We are. We so are. So for whatever whatever that means to our listeners, you may know. Yes. And uh, and so we are we are just strong personality types to sum that up. And so uh, I, it's been challenging for me at times. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I love our leadership here at our, our church. It uh, often makes it more easy uh, mm-hmm. to, to respect and honor your leaders. Uh, but I've been in context where uh, I really struggled with that, you know, and, and really, if I'm going to be honest, my entire life, you know, yeah. even from uh, my parents or people who were my supervisor or, or yeah. you know, things like that. And so... Uh, well, well, can I ask you a question with that? I'm, I'm curious, yeah. just like we're friends and we know each other well, yeah. but but I'm wondering, so like watching this on my own life, um, I'm wondering if for you, I, I tend to find myself in situations to where if the person that's the designated leader... That, that steps in. If, if I look at that leader and I'm thinking, you know, they're not a good leader or they, they're they not doing this right. Right. Normally, my gut instinct is either I'm going to step up and, and lead or I'm definitely going to rebel. Well, I'll be I'll be even more transparent. It comes down to uh, if I don't like the way they lead. Yeah. If I'm not careful, my flesh will tell me you should step in and do it. Yeah. And, and that is not, and I'm talking about, again, very early age that starts showing up and, uh, very similar, the two of us. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, and, and I think, you know, we're being honest and vulnerable about that because we've grown a lot. And again, the leadership here has helped us tremendously. Very much. Know? Um, and so we have the privilege of working with great, great leaders. Uh, but you know, as I look back throughout my, my, uh, history of ministry and history of just adulthood, uh, that's where God has had to mature me mm-hmm. a, a ton and, uh, and really, I think it's, it's you know, we can almost be the poster people for, uh, you know, what everyone struggles with, which is, hey, if you put a leader in position that I don't like yeah. or that I don't agree with, and it can, we can talk about any, any you know, it can be your employer, it can be a political position, uh, it can be really anything. Yeah. We start to have these uh, ideas of, you know, fleshly desires that creep in, sinful desires that creep in where we don't want to honor that person in leadership. And Peter says, hey... Even if it's an emperor that's going to persecute you, even yeah. if it's an emperor who's going to be anti-Christian, I want you to honor that emperor. And man, you talk about setting a standard and setting a tone. Mm-hmm. Peter was saying it, so you knew you knew he was going to have to live it too. Yeah. But uh, you know, I can't imagine a a more difficult ask uh, for people who are trying to be obedient to their to 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 Christ and live out their faith. To say, hey, there's going to be someone who's literally going to kill you for doing that. Yeah. And I need you to honor them. Well, I mean, it really makes me think of, you know, the the previous series that we did uh, when we were looking through Daniel. And and you look at, like, Daniel or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and you see both of their situations where as followers of God, they have persecution coming their way. There are laws that are going in place that that make them have to really step out of their comfort zone. And it's amazing to me because the line they drew is we will honor and we will care and we will love like the people around us and the leadership above us until we hit that line. And when we hit that line, we're also not going to oppose. Right. We're we're, we're going to draw a line in the sand, but even in the way that we oppose, we're going to do it in an honorable way. Like I, I think of Daniel like praying. Right. You know, where it was, he knew he couldn't. He made sure that he was honorable to the leaders every step of the way. And when it came down to his prayer, he didn't make it a public thing. He didn't go out and say, oh, well, you're saying I can't pray. I'm going to go to the street in the middle of town center and pray. Scripture said, you know, he did what he always did. So he didn't start something new in an effort to be defiant. He was just consistent. And he he did it at home. And obviously, he he ended up being in the wrong with that. But even in the the face of being wrong for God, he was honorable every step of the way. 
and for wrong me, in, wrong in the face of public opinion. Yes, right. in the face of public court opinion. Of public yeah, opinion. the yeah. court of public opinion. Um, but like for me, seeing that and then looking at my own life, or even just you know the American Christian, I'm like, man, that's difficult. Right. Like I run into that. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I I totally agree. And you know what's what blew my mind, Jordan, is I was walking through the the scriptures and and hearing these instructions given by Peter to the believers in the midst of a storm, in the midst of an empire that's not receptive to Christianity, in the midst of hostility towards Christians. Mm-hmm. He tells them to live honorably, to respect the emperor, to respect the people that uh, the emperor puts in positions of authority uh, under him, and to basically you know just respect all that. And then he and so for me, I started reading that. And uh, one of the things I talked about is we all are okay hearing that. And then when we put it into practice, what we want to do is we want to figure out where are we allowed to draw the line. Yes. Okay. So it means like I do want to honor and respect every person. Yeah. But where do I draw the line of like, I'm not doing it anymore because you just crossed that line. And I see that like even in in, uh, marriages, you know, you know, where people are saying, I love my spouse, but I have a line. And and when that line gets crossed, I'm not putting up with this anymore. You know, I'm looking for an out at that point. I'm looking for an excuse to end the the relationship or, hey, I work at this job and I love this job. But if that person gets promoted and put over me, I'm going to draw the line and I'm not going to respect that individual or. You know, you you can, you know, take that a million different directions, but we all have that line. Mm-hmm. And I think what's interesting is what Peter's also going to do. He's going to say, uh, I want you to really be aware that that line is not non-existent in the life of a believer. Mm-hmm. And and that is mind-blowing. But And, and the reason why is because he does two things at the end of this passage that are profound. One, he he begins to address specifically household slaves. Mm-hmm. people in slavery. And he says, I want you to honor your master. So he's taking the person in the audience that would have been hearing these words read by this letter, you know, from this letter, they would have been hearing it and they would say, Hey, you don't know my situation though. You don't know my context. The slave sitting in the audience says, man, you don't know how bad I have it right now. And I'm not trying to downplay it at all. He's sitting there going, I, it's going to be impossible for me to honor someone in authority over me because I am in a horrible situation and Mm -hmm. I'm being mistreated. And Peter in the letter addresses specifically that role. He says, if you are a slave, honor your master, even if your master is an abusive and and unkind master. I mean, he goes into that level of, here's an example I want to give you of who needs to be putting this into practice. And so I'm like, man, there. You know, there's no other person sitting in that audience that says, hey, my situation's worse than that, yeah, right? Yeah, that's true. And uh, and he says, but I need you to still be Christ-like and honor those people, uh, even if you're in that situation. And then, if that's not strong enough, he concludes the chapter by saying, and let me tell you about what Jesus did, yeah. right? And what I know the you, Jesus card? Right. And so I know <laughs> uh, you went into detail greatly about the... Uh, the example of, hey, if we're going to talk about where the line's drawn and the standard set and, and when can you throw in the towel, let me tell you about what Jesus did for sinners. Mm-hmm. And you kind of uh, shared about that in your message. Talk a little bit about what it means for Jesus to be that standard, that example that's set for us. Yeah, I know for sure. I mean, the to, to overview it, the, the point that I originally made was we're not being called to do anything that Christ has not already done. And so obviously when we very, like the very start of this series, Pastor Chris had a a great point and it was the idea that we need to imitate the father. And that when we imitate the father, how we're able to do that is we're able to look at the life of Christ. And that's where the rubber meets the road. Because if if we sit down and and this is what I love about scripture, there's really not a lot of ambiguity and stuff like this. Mm. Like I'm going to tangent real quick and then I'm going to, I'm going to bring it back. No, you're good. But like, just like you talked about with Peter addressing the the slave in the room, like he got to the detail. You can't miss how we're supposed to act as believers. No loopholes. Yeah, there's no loopholes. Yeah. Like unless you just choose to ignore that passage, right? <laughs> right. Um, and it's the same with the character of Christ. If if you as a believer say, hey, I want to grow spiritually, and the way that I'm going to grow spiritually is by getting in the Word of God, and you study the Word of God line by line, there are no loopholes available. Uh, one of the things I, I tell my students at the University of Mobile all the time is 
their scripture is our gold standard that we live under and scripture is black and white. It, right. it doesn't give us room to, to make the adjustment or the call ourselves. Right. Because when we, Romans 10, 9, when we confess that Jesus is Lord and, and with our mouths, right. we're saying, hey, you're in charge right. and I'm going to live under whatever you say, right. no exceptions. Jordan, and, let me ask you, you ever read a verse that you didn't like, that you're like, man, I don't want to have to apply that verse to my life? Quite a lot of them. <laughs> Quite a lot of Isn't them. that funny though? Like, yeah. We're like, Jesus, you are Lord. And we run across that verse and it's like, oh, come on. Well, come it, on. Really? And you know what helps me through that? Um, this is, this is, I was actually having a conversation in class the other day and it was the, the word I used, I believe, was audacity. Mm. And it was, if God tells us something in his word that makes us uncomfortable and it's hard for us to grasp and we, and we make the decision, hey, maybe that's not for me. At the end of the day, what we're doing is we're saying the creator of the entire universe that spoke everything into existence and is telling us the best way that life could be lived is wrong. Right. So how much audacity do we have to have mm. to, to look at what was breathed out by the creator who literally breathed out everything we see right. and say, hey, you got all of this right, but God, I don't know. How, I don't know about this one. Yeah. I think yeah. I know more. Right. Right. right? And. I think, you know, we, we just kind of have to put ourselves in check. And when we do that, and when we get into the Word of God, and we look at the life of Jesus, we see, just as Peter was pointing out, that Jesus was persecuted, but he didn't return it. It says he was reviled, but he didn't revile in return. Right. You, you, you literally look at the Romans, right? And, and this is what I love, is that Jesus died for the Gentile and the Jew, right? right. So Jesus' death on the cross was for the Romans. And the Romans that walked him through um, his crucifixion were spitting on him. Right. They were mocking him. They were 100%. torturing him. They were they were they were making fun of him. They were literally taking his garments so they could sell. Like the worst of the worst of humanity is, is on display in this scene, and in my opinion. And they're also there when he's hanging on the cross and says, Father, forgive them. Exactly. Father, forgive them. I'm getting goosebumps, bro. I know, man. right? And so they're doing all of this. And Jesus' response to their actions, yep. the guy who literally con commanded legions of angels, who could have at any point in time called down tens of thousands of angels to wipe them out, does not respond with returning the punishment equally. He doesn't respond with his own fleshly desires. He responds with grace and forgiveness. Right. Not only calling out to God saying, hey, Father, forgive them, but ultimately dying for the very same people that put all of that weight on him. Mm. And that is what we're called to follow. And that that tees up. I want to just read this verse because it's so good. First Peter chapter two, uh, one of the verses that we covered, verse twenty one, says, "For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in His steps." I mean, that's yeah. it's not. Hey, he he suffered, and so you get to live the good life. Mm -hmm. It's he suffered, and, and you're going to have to suffer too. And you're going to have to suffer even at times under leadership that you're not in favor of. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to suffer in times because you're in a context that makes it uncomfortable to live out your faith. But Jesus is setting the standard here of what that looks like, right? Jesus is, the, is setting the example for us so that we might follow in his footsteps. And then that's, that's encouraging. That's heavy. So at the heavy. same time, because like for me, it's, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing to comprehend. It's a difficult thing to grasp, but it's also encouraging. You know, um, one of the things that, that, that I always go back to is the Great Commission, which the Great Commission is obviously like, oh, yeah, go and share the gospel, make disciples and teach people. And so often, I think when we when we recite it for, for that purpose, we forget the very last line, hmm. which is the last line is Jesus saying, and I will be with you always. Right. And so it's so encouraging to me to remember that line in situations mm. like this and situations uh, where we're suffering and situations where we're, it's hard to honor a leader and in situations that we're going to face in our storms right. is, is Jesus is saying, hey, not only have I walked through this, not only have I given you the example of what it looks like, but I haven't gone anywhere. Right. Like I'm still here with you. Right. And, and for me, that, that's a massive encouragement to know that I'm not in this alone. 
and I mean, really going back to the Old Testament, it's 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 the beautiful tale of of the the other one in the fire, right? You know, the fourth man in the fire. Oh, yeah. That in the midst of the worst suffering that that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had ever faced, Jesus, right, a Christophany, but we would say Jesus, right, is right there with them, right, bearing that weight for them. And in reality, the reason that they they didn't face it. It was because they were trusting in him. Yeah. And that's what Jesus tells us. He's like, hey, in the midst of your suffering, is it going to be hard? Yeah. Are you going to be in a furnace? Yeah. But if you trust in me, if you use me as your shelter, storm shelter, right? right? Yeah. I will bear that weight. Yeah. And I think what what is important, though, and, and one of the things I had to clarify as I walked through the passage was, you know, God here is not condoning abuse. God mm-hmm. is not Very encouraging true. abuse. You know, none of that. So I don't want to get that twisted at all. Even though we're called to endure and to and to willingly suffer through things, um, you know, because people, when you start to apply this truth, it's like, hey, what if I am in an abusive situation or mm-hmm. an abusive relationship? Like, hey, am I supposed to honor that person? Well, yeah, you're still called to honor that person, but God's not giving you, uh, you know, giving a pass on the abuse or, or excusing yeah, that of course, in any way. Of course. And so I had this guy uh, ask me, and this is the last thing I want to kind of share this. Uh, he said in our small group, he asked the question, he said, well, how do you know? If, if it's a horrible situation like that, how do you know when you need to uh, basically like draw a line mm-hmm. and say, hey, like I, I can't tolerate that because that that's abusive or that's too much or whatever. And I said, really, I have to kind of work backwards from it in the, in the whole idea of uh, when I start wanting to get that line ready, draw that line myself of, of I've had enough or I don't want to do this anymore, this isn't appropriate or whatever it may be. What I have to check is my selfish ambitions, my mm. sinful nature. And so I can give example, example, example after uh, uh, of, of this idea of, hey, you're in this situation, and when is enough enough, man? When are you going to just stop? You know, when are you going to? Yeah. And I said, anytime I start to have those thoughts, I have to say, why, why am I wanting to adjust that? Is it selfish ambitions and sinful desires driving that? And so for us, I think, you know, we, we got to kind of look at every situation in our lives and say, is it really selfishness and sin that's driving me trying to not suffer, trying to not follow the example of Christ, trying to not do what I've been called to do in this situation? And so, Jordan, man, it's been a ton of fun to be on the podcast with you today, sure. man. I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate just being able to team up with you and work on staff here. Oh, yeah, and, of course. And do what God has called us to do. And we hope that us just sharing from our hearts and what God's been doing in us uh, through this whole process of figuring out what it looks like to be in the storm shelter of Christ. I hope that this has been an encouragement to you and that you can apply this truth to your life as well. And we love to hear the stories of what God's doing in your life. Oh, yeah. And so uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. God bless. Have a fantastic week. I'll have a good one.